Brent, what's the second year MPP student? Mary Driscoll, first year MBA student at Duke School. Hi, I'm Teresa Sparsa. I work for Anthony Sto at the program at Global Health and Technology Access here in San Antonio. I'm Nora Morris, and I'm a first year Master's of Public Policy student. I'm Mr. Uh, my name's Maureen Ritchie. I'm also a second year Master's of Public Policy student. I'm Rishma, I'm a senior undergraduate um, studying in economics and public policy. I'm Fiona Morgan, I graduated from the Master of Public Policy program last year, here, and I'm an associate in research at the Dewitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy and um, the Relations and Technology Committee. I'm Marianne Feldman, and I'm a faculty member at uh, Brigham Young Public Policy at the University of North Carolina, Davis. I'm Holly Carter, and I'm Marianne's associate. with self-help and the Center for Responsible Women. I'm Mary Collins and I work with Ed Sloot and Barry in the Center for Community <coughs> Philanthropy. I'm Jenny Owen, Sanford School and Center for Child and Family Policy. I'm Jamie Athard, I'm a dual business and public policy graduate too. I'm Susan Feit, I'm the Executive Director of the National Conference for Community and Justice of the Piedmont Triad. For your purposes, I also directed um, the Mirai Fund in Israel mm -hmm. and the New Israel Fund I worked with. I'm Richard Schaffer, I'm a professor in the law school where I teach tax subjects and nonprofit organizations. There you go. Wow. Well, this is most impressive, and thank you for welcoming me. And I feel like, in many ways, I'm home because although I've been a New Yorker for over 25 years, I'm actually a Southerner. And when I return, I find myself um, going back to my own language and lexicon and, and talking like a Southerner. And I, um, I have to mind myself because I'll return to New York and, and people will think um, something's happened to me. Um, and something has happened to me. It's so nice to be around civilized, lovely people. <laughs> and, um, so thank you for um, coming today. And um, it is a real treat for me, um, for many reasons, to uh, be on this enormously extraordinary campus. I've never been to Duke. And of course, uh, the reputation of Duke is, is global. And um, Coming, um, I completely understand the allure of this place. It's magical. It's simply magical. And um, I was guided uh, by um, a certified uh, tour guide um, <laughs> and his group today. And of course, um, the um, initial uh, invitation from um, the distinguished uh, Joel Fleischman um, caught me completely by surprise because what would Joel have to ever? Uh, have an interest in listening to me talk about anything, and so I'm th I was thrilled when he and Ed reached out and said, why don't you come uh, down to Duke and spend a little time, so what a treat, and to see old friends like Holly and Pat and everyone, it's just really great, and um, the newest trustee of the Ford Foundation, Martin Eakes, it's just a real, real thrill to uh, be here with all of you young people, and that includes you, Joel, and Holly. <laughs> so, um, let, me, let me just um, say, this is not meant to be really a, a talk. I mean, I'm not, well, I am much of a talker, I'm not much of a talker, which of course is not true. <laughs> but but I, I am, um, I, I'm much more conversational, and so uh, I hope this is a conversation, and I'm happy to uh, frame the conversation. And of course, um, Ed said, you know, think about something provocative, and, and this idea of the yellow brick road, for me, um, conjures up a lot of things, um, but, but it's really true when you think about philanthropy and um, American philanthropy. So much of it is about um, idealism and uh, our, our ideals as a society and our dreams and aspirations for the world. And um, my own experience, um, I realized much later uh, in life, um, was in many ways shaped by philanthropy because I was um, a poor uh, person living in a rural community, being raised by a single mother, and, um, and I was 
six years old, and someone knocked on our door, and she was there to recruit the first class of Head Start. And in, in this little rural um, uh, Texas town where um, this program was being set up, um, I, throughout my life, uh, benefited from, from great both, both uh, public policy as well as private philanthropy. But what I didn't understand until um, really coming to this sector was just um, the tremendous um, role of philanthropy um, in, in really human achievement and social change in the 20th century. And so what I wanted to talk a little bit about was the idea of, of achievement and social change in the 20th century um, and how American philanthropy really shaped it. But what I really want to focus on ultimately is the question of um, what role philanthropy in the 21st century can play in shaping um, social change and shaping um, a narrative arc for um, how societies live and how we think about um, um, civilization. So let me just say my story um, is, is really not that interesting. It gets most interesting when I join philanthropy, which is, you know, of course, what most people in philanthropy like to think is, you know, your life is not interesting until you join the foundation. And then everything changes. All of a sudden, you're just far more interesting than you ever were. It happened to me too. Um, and so, um, like many people in philanthropy, I didn't find philanthropy because I didn't know what it was. Um, it actually found me. Uh, I was, uh, as, as certainly uh, Ed and Hottie know, I was um, minding my own business, working in Harlem, um, um, running a nonprofit with the remit of rebuilding um, and revitalizing Harlem, uh, which hard to believe, uh, as you know, honey, from that day on that bus, looking at the hole in the ground for the supermarket, that it actually has happened. And uh, for those of you who are New Yorkers, um, the idea that Harlem can actually be a desirable place to live was remarkably um, not um, common thought in uh, 1990. And so. Um, I spent a decade uh, basically doing that with the support of uh, foundations like the Servant Foundation, which Ed ran and which made a huge difference in uh, the Harlem community. But like many people uh, in the, who come to philanthropy, one day my phone rang. And um, it was a person who said, um, who was a foundation that worked with us um, at the Abyssinian Church, um, the Development Corporation. And she said, well, you know, I just had lunch with this man called Gordon Conway. And, He's uh, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and I told him about you, and he was really intrigued, so you may hear from him. And I said, oh, well, that's great. And I went back to my you know, business, and, and, uh, and a week later, I did hear from him, and, um, you know, there starts my story on, on, on the road. Um, I found myself uh, moving from a little office on 138th Street, where, which would occasionally be... Um, visited by my little friend, um, one of the Burmans, um, who seemed to love our building, and um, to this amazing office, which was designed by Maya Lin, with a fountain in it, and where there was a private dining room, which was pretty amazing, when I was used to walking down the street, um, and hopefully having uh, the Wendy's be open, um, to this place, which was really rather remarkable. But what was most remarkable about it was um, the history, and the, 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 the work of the Rockefeller Foundation, and when one thinks about uh, human achievement in the 20th century, uh, it's very hard to not uh, think about what the Rockefeller Foundation uh, contributed to that. Um, while most people wouldn't have a reason to know, um, there is so much of what we take for granted today uh, that, that the Foundation um, helped uh, and contributed to. And certainly as Joel has documented in his very well-researched book um, on philanthropy, uh, RF had um, just this amazing um, uh, impact on society, not just on um, the, the, the United States, but on, on the world. Now, of course, much of that was due to the um, origins of the donor. John D. Rockefeller was uh, the original um, uber capitalist, and he, for his day, was uh, even richer than Bill Gates is, if you can imagine that. And, um, really through philanthropy transform his own reputation. Um, it's, many people um, forget that John D. Rockefeller was um, a reviled person um, for most of his life. Uh, he was thought of as just a, 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 a horrible person. And, um, and he spent a good part of his later years and his fortune 
in transforming um, his own image in, in the public, and he and his son uh, were very successful uh, in doing that. And they were also very successful in making huge change uh, in America and in the world. Um, and he was so important, um, ultimately, John D. Rockefeller's annual letter, which basically was uh, what would we today call an agenda-setting uh, uh, item, um, was published in the New York Times. And it was because he was so influential that people wanted to know what John D. Rockefeller felt were the issues of the day and what he felt was important in terms of the public's attention. Um, and today we see Bill Gates doing the same thing. Bill Gates has, in the last three years, initiated this idea of the, the Bill Gates annual letter, which in many ways is, is modeled on John D. Rockefeller's um, annual letter. But what John D. Rockefeller uh, believed, uh, of course, he was a devout, deep uh, Christian, and he, in his own mind, uh, felt that, um, that he had a higher calling, and he wrote a lot about it. But he was also a, a believer in science and in the ability and the potential of science to transform mankind, as he put it. And, and, and so he invested a lot in science, and he invested in infrastructure. Um, and that ranges from things that we today like take for granted that didn't exist or was just fledgling, um, things like public health, which we think of today as sort of, well, of course, I mean, well, there weren't public health schools, there weren't um, many, many reputable medical colleges, uh, there were no uh, research institutes of, of, of any real uh, repute, there was very little um, data collection uh, and understanding of who we were as Americans. And it really was through investments of, of, of the RF, um, to help create things like the Social Science Research uh, Council and organizations like that, as well as the Social Security system. I mean, the Social Security system was um, originally a research project of, of a group of researchers who were funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And they ultimately made recommendations to uh, the uh, Roosevelt administration that, that, that translated to ultimately the Social Security Act. Um, but there was a lot of R&D. And, and that was the way in which uh, RF uh, saw it as sort of the R&D engine uh, and, and, and resource uh, and investor. Um, now remember, this was before our federal government had any of this activity um, going on. And in fact, until World War II, the Rockefeller Foundation gave more in foreign aid than the United States government did. Um, um, and, and so it's hard to believe that a single foundation could have that much power and that much influence. And I want to come back to this question of influence because at the end of the day that's, that has to be front and central to what philanthropy is about. But over its years, it continued. Um, when Harry Truman experienced what, what was going on in Mexico in terms of the poverty and the famines that, that it's hard, again, hard to believe today, but there was a time when the country south of the border of the United States literally had famines like Somalia where people were, were without food for days and weeks and died because they were without food. And the idea of food security um, was something that, that emerged from work of the Rockefeller Foundation ultimately leading to the Green Revolution and you know hundreds of millions of people um, being food secure. There were many um, negative externalities of the Green Revolution that the environmentalists will talk about, but um, certainly the, uh, the core objective of the Green Revolution, which was, was to help feed people and, and bring national uh, food security, was achieved in many parts of the world, and in fact, the Rockefeller Foundation remains the only foundation where a program officer won a Nobel Prize because they were in charge of the foundation's food security program. And the history of, of that is in itself a book. Joel, I think you should, that should be your next one. Just what happened, the fight between the food security staff and the board about who actually should receive uh, the, the Nobel uh, Prize. Uh, that's not, one, of the two, one of the two prizes that the foundation won. Yes, and of course more, more Nobel laureates and the, the number of, 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 of scientists who were funded, um, really, really amazing. But it just wasn't science and technology because Although John D. Rockefeller was a very conservative man, he was also um, um, a little um, heretical, and, and he liked to do things that, um, that 
were, in, in his own mind, consistent with his own Christian principles. And one of those things was his investment in Negro education. This was a huge issue for him and something that got him into <coughs> lots of trouble with his elite friends. Um, and he had a long history of supporting um, institutions like Spelman, um, which actually wasn't Spelman, it was the Atlanta Baptist Color Seminary, blah, 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 one of those names. But ultimately, it became Spelman College. Now, in the African American community, we have continued the folklore of the Spelman College. I mean, Laura Spelman, in our mind, is a runaway slave lady, and she w was determined to get an education on her own, and she founded this school. <laughs> well, Laura Spelman was John D. Rockefeller's mother, and, and the school. <laughs> The school became Spelman College because John D. Rockefeller over time gave so much money to the school and felt that ultimately the idea of a, a, a higher education for Negro women was something he believed um, and, and wanted to support it. And so he gave Spelman his first endowment in, um, and, and that's why there's Rockefeller um, um, Hall at Spelman and the, the family has continued its con um, involvement uh, with Spelman um, to this day. But he also did things like um, sending people from um, the, the north to the south to look at the, the public school systems and really call out and shame um, a lot of people, um, who some of whom were his business partners and uh, some of whom were the elites of the south. And, um, and he really uh, created quite a ruckus. Uh, but he believed firmly, um, so much so that he set up the General Education Board, which had as its mission um, ensuring um, full access to education for Negroes across the South. And the, the, the GEB itself is, um, with, was an extraordinary organization um, with all sorts <coughs> of achievements over its 40-year um, history. Um, but I could go on and on about RF. I mean, I love urban planning, and it was only... Uh, through, uh, uh, I think, a, an accident of my research assistant that we found out that the Rockefeller Foundation had funded Jane Jacobs to write uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and had never done anything to even acknowledge it in the history of, of it. But there were hundreds of things like that when you sort of go through the archives of just that one institution um, that, that I could talk about. And ultimately, the foundation itself employed over a thousand people. I mean, there were over a thousand people around the world uh, on uh, the Rockefeller Foundation payroll. So the history is deep, it's rich. I, being at the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, was um, completely both uh, humbled and awestruck uh, and challenged by this question of this huge legacy um, and a desire to continue that legacy. Uh, but a reality that the landscape has changed. And so I'll come back to, to want to talk about that landscape um, and the challenges ahead. But first, let me reflect on Ford Foundation, because I have, um, I'm very fortunate and um, a little unusual, because it's not uh, customary for uh, people, particularly at, at senior levels, to um, hop around foundations. Um, it's not customary to find a person who has been at uh, Carnegie um, uh, end up at Rockefeller, um, or at Ford end up at Robert Wood Johnson. Um, and, and so um, I've been in this unique uh, position of having had, in many ways, I was a vice president at Rockefeller and uh, now at Ford, of having a bird's eye view of two really storied institutions, but with very different histories. Um, certainly both with big impact, but very different history. Um, what to say about uh, our donor, Henry Ford. Um, so if, um, if, if Rockefeller Foundation reflected John D. Rockefeller's um, deep, thoughtful, reflective uh, journals and writings uh, about philanthropy uh, and, and uh, the kind of moral calling of it, um, Henry Ford uh, wasn't much of a writer, um, and um, gosh, I put this. Um, Henry Ford was was um, was a man of uh, great ambition and wealth. Uh, but if John D. Rockefeller was uh, a globalist, because he was, I mean, John D. Rockefeller believed that that oil and and all of what he was doing was actually the same way today. Bill Gates and Tim Berners-Lee talked about the internet and all connecting us. John D. Rockefeller said, well, you know, 
these extractive industries are going to connect us. The oil is going to connect us. It's going to make make trains go faster, make you know cargo go faster. Um, Henry Ford was not a globalist. Um, he was an isolationist. And um, if John D. Rockefeller's view was about the world, Henry Ford's view was about Dearborn and about Detroit. And um, the Ford Foundation really came into being um, because of two things. Um, one, um, the uh, unfortunate and premature death of Henry Ford's son, Etzel, um, who died um, at a very young age. He was, I think, 49. Um, or maybe 50, but he was very young, and um, he died of cancer, and it was um, unexpected. And um, and his son, Henry Ford II, um, um, who was in the Navy when he died, but who came back to take over and run the company, ascended to head the Ford Motor Company and, and ultimately the Ford Foundation. And the second thing uh, was, was that the company went public, became the IPO uh, for the company. Um, and the Ford Foundation, through a complicated um, tax uh, maneuver, ended up being the largest uh, single stakeholder in the Ford Motor Company. And for the family, it was very important to control the company. And the foundation was a vehicle that allowed that to happen. And um, and the and the, the tax benefits um, obviously um, were substantial, and so a system a, a, a really complex uh, initial complex a system was set up uh, for that transfer, and, and then a few years later the company went public. Now Henry Ford um, was not um, he was very suspicious of Easterners um, and. Um, did not, uh, he, he hated coming to New York, um, he didn't like many of the people that he would meet in New York, and um, he uh, was very suspicious. And his son, Edsel, really um, bore the brunt of his father's um, lack of interest and views about the kinds of people you meet in New York. And um, so he really never was allowed. I mean, he would stay local. He went to school in Michigan, and he, um, and like is often the case when, when wealthy parents are raised by strict parents, their children are then indulged. And so Henry Ford II got to go to Hotchkiss and Yale and hang out with the very people his grandfather abhorred. Um, and so um, at Yale, he met people like Nelson Rockefeller and, and very much became um, impressed with what he was learning about uh, social science and about um, the world. Um, and so, um, as a result of his father's death, he was head of both the company and the Ford Foundation. Um, and he uh, decided, certainly once the foundation became really overnight the wealthiest foundation, um, I mean, if it's, it's hard to imagine, but even more than Gates today. Um, and Ford was larger than Carnegie and Rockefeller together um, overnight. And so um, he decided that the foundation needed uh, to do a couple of things. One, to think about a grander vision and what that mission would be. And then secondly, to get out of Detroit. And so um, he appointed a commission of um, uh, Eastern um, establishment to um, look at the issues of, um, of the world and they came away with a strategy, uh, an idea of a mission that really focused on international relations and the world uh, and, the, and, the, and the U.S.'s place in the world and how we uh, worked uh, in terms of uh, international development and, and, and uh, international relations. Poverty, um, poverty reduction was another area of great interest. Um, education, um, all of this, remember, in the context, and it's hard because the foundations today are often accused of taking one perspective or the other, but, but much of this was in the context of great concern um, in the United States about communism. And, and so our work in international development, there's a reason the Ford Foundation's offices were in Latin America where they were, and in Africa where they were, and in India where they were. Um, but particularly in Africa and Latin America, where there was great concern about communism and, and the need uh, to ensure that American um, 
an American perspective was infused into uh, the, uh, the, the countries that themselves were vulnerable and at risk um, for being um, swayed over to communism. And, and so a lot of our work was done very much in alignment with State Department policy and with um, um, government priorities. But all of this is to say that um, by the, the, the late 1950s, Henry Ford um, had moved the foundation to New York and had also decided that um, uh, the foundation should have this, uh, should have a presence, a permanent presence. And out of that came um, his um, decision to hire um, Kevin Roche to build something that had been pretty unprecedented um, and remains unprecedented, although if you visit the Gate Foundation's new Oh my God, um, it is um, quite amazing uh, to see, but I think the way people now are talking who have been out to Seattle, I mean, I think this is the way people talked about the Ford Foundation in 1968 when it opened, but, but bottom line is he um, hired Kevin Roche and this really quite uh, marvelous, um, rather uh, splendid uh, piece of architecture in the middle of Manhattan was, was built, and it is a marvel to work in, and it's um, a, a modern landmark, and uh, a really remarkable um, a building. Um, and when you talk about influence, um, Ford Foundation had different kind of influence because I think at Ford, whereas at Rockefeller what led was, was science and technology and R&D, at Ford what led was this idea of, of social change and this idea that a foundation um, in a different way, and Rockefeller was very clear, I mean, this, this was as much about change as Ford was, but Ford clearly had a point of view about the need for a more inclusive society, uh, a need for um, a, a more equitable society, and a perspective on rights, like human rights, which actually as a term didn't even exist uh, when the Ford Foundation started working on human rights, um, and took a, a pretty uh, aggressive agenda in the 1960s, um, um, which again, a, a, a long book could be written, but just very quickly I think um, education, um, a big area, the creation of area studies is just one of many, many examples. But um, uh, the foundation had an agenda that on um, every college campus that there would be area studies, women's studies, African American studies, American studies, um, and, and that these new disciplines would be created and that they would become part of the kind of uh, canon of American education and in many ways, um, some would say for good and bad, it has succeeded because there's not a, a good university in America that does not have an area studies program. Um, and um, another area was, was urban and rural poverty. Again, a lot of work with um, the federal government on, um, on, on testing and piloting different kinds of programs. A lot of the work in the Great Society, um, Ford Foundation was engaged, um, whether it was the creation of uh, the idea of Community Development Corporation, which Martin knows a lot about. That was something that emerged from a set of Ford Foundation investments um, going back uh, to the early 60s. Microfinance in the international world. Um, uh, Muhammad Yunus, one of his first grants was from the Ford Foundation um, in, the, in the Bangladesh office in arts and culture and the humanities. It's hard to believe that dance companies, theaters, regional theaters, symphony orchestras, all of these uh, in the 1960s Ford Foundation made huge commitments because the idea again was if the United States was going to be um, a global leader it needed to have uh, a great culture and great culture represented our Euro European ideals of symphonies and dance and theater and all of those things and so uh, we were hell-bent to be as good as those Europeans and um, and in many ways, uh, the, the investments of Ford Foundation and others uh, did that. Along the same lines, public media. Again, hard to believe that there wasn't a PBS and a CPB and all these things that we take for granted, but the Ford Foundation made uh, seminal investments in those areas. Um, and so I think this question of influence, when one looks at the foundations, both Ford and Rockefeller in this regard, investment in human capital is where it becomes so apparent if you travel anywhere in the world, and even in the United States, the number of times you meet people who say, I was a Rockefeller Foundation fellow, I was a Ford fellow. Um, in countries around the world, people like Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon and Bartek Gregorian were all Ford and Rockefeller fellows. Um, they were in their countries and were given an opportunity to come to the United States um, to train and to get 
um, degree. So, so I guess in, in summary what I'm saying is these are just two examples of institutions uh, in American philanthropy that had huge influence on the course of, of history in the 20th century. Um, and while most people don't know it, um, it is in fact a fact. And what I'm fascinated by is not romanticizing and deifying the people and the programs that came out of it, but really asking the question, um, can American philanthropy today have this kind of influence? I mean, it's, it to, that to me is the seminal question. How do you have influence at a time when the way influence is actually created and wielded uh, and sustained is a very different world? Influence was wielded and sustained and really owned by a group of elite white men in the Northeast for most of the 20th century. Um, and one can look in the Rockefeller Foundation files as I have and see letters or telegrams to various people from Dean Rusk or from John D. Rockefeller III um, saying, here's what I think you need to do. And basically, go do it. Um, with very little consultation, with very little, you know, where's the community board, what's the planning commission think about this, or, no, it was, it, this is my view, and I've talked to, you know, Arthur Salzberger, and I've talked to my friend in Washington, and this is what we think you need to do. And, and that was, in fact, the way influence uh, was, was, was wielded. And I think today, um, and again, it's a, it may be a simplification, but I think it's certainly um, uh, clear that today we have a more complex, complicated, convoluted uh, process for making decisions, for resolving uh, public policy questions, um, and for um, charting that course deciding who charts that course um, and, and being able to actually implement, execute, and sustain it. So what I would say is um, a couple of things about influence today. Um, one is that, there, again, there is no singular institution. Um, not the Rockefeller Foundation, not the Ford Foundation, not even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because as Bill Gates has said on many occasions, um, their work on disease eradication um, is, he is hoping for great impact, but the NIH and the CDC and, well, just those two, forget about the, the Department of Health and Human Services, spend more in a year than the Gates Endowment. And so today, it's, we're not building infrastructure the way we did 40 or 50 years ago. We're figuring out ways to sustain that infrastructure. Um, or uh, to dismantle it. I mean, in, in many cases, the question is, do we dismantle the infrastructure? So how do you have influence in that conversation? Um, there are a couple of things I think we should, we should consider. One is um, that there is a very, <clears throat> influence today is, is much more shaped by a diffuse uh, and um, sort of disaggregated system of communication. Um, social media and technology have completely disrupted the ability of a single institution to command uh, and, and set the agenda. It's, it, when um, the entire country um, watches three networks and public television and reads three newspapers, um, it, it's much easier to uh, decide the agenda. Um, it's much harder today to do that. So, so the landscape in which media is, 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 is and, and influence happens, it's just far more difficult. Um, political engagement. Um, there's something called the 69 Act, which, which has impacted the way in which foundations can actually engage in, uh, in, in the political sphere. Again, there were times when, when John D. Rockefeller would call the president or call the Secretary of Treasury or Education and say, you know, this is what you need to do. Now, the foundation will add money to it, but ultimately, you need to get with Sam Rayburn and this person and pass the law that makes this happen. 
I mean, they literally would have conversations like that that are documented in the files and the archives of the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, today, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation cannot pick up the phone and call anybody and say, I want to talk to you about a law, or I want to talk to you about a piece of legislation that I think needs, because we've had this great program, and it's piloted, and it's shown it's worked, it's got great potential, and I want to talk to you about a law. It's prohibited. Um, and you... And the degree to which you can engage in this in this uh, sphere of politics, um, while it's it's very clearly articulated um, in in the law, um, it, the degree to which individual foundations are prepared and willing to engage is greatly varied, and and so um, the question of political engagement is is another uh, reason why wielding influence today is much harder than it was. 40 or 50 years ago. Um, so how do we think about um, change, right? So it's not just enough to talk about what's wrong and how. Um, I, I want to uh, just leave with a couple of thoughts about, about what we can do as we think about um, how to have change. So one is, I think, um, change today is, is much more going to be through uh, co-created processes. Um, uh, when the, and there is a history. It's not as if foundations have never worked together. In the area of public media, for example, um, uh, Rockefeller and, and Carnegie and Ford worked very collaboratively in, in setting up uh, the CPB system and in uh, journalism and, and things of this area. But, but for most of our histories, foundations uh, have been uh, challenged in the area of collaboration. There's been far more talk about it than actual uh, implementation. Um, and part of this I call the kind of egos and logos challenge. I think you have um, uh, board members and presidents uh, who have very strong views about themselves and their institutions. And uh, to actually say you may need uh, to uh, subordinate your ego and other things because the bigger interest here is that you need to collaborate with this person and that person and that person. It's not as easy as, as one might think. Now, it, it's, it's not to say that it can't happen, but it just um, doesn't happen naturally. And in fact, um, the whole movement around metrics and accountability has in fact uh, contributed to um, the challenge of collaboration. Because much of the discussion about uh, accountability is, has, has devolved into foundations wanting to be able to know what their dollars are buying, right? So, so it's hard to know what your dollars are buying if you're putting your dollars in a pot with five other foundations. Um, and what you're trying to understand is actually what, what social change or what innovation you, your institution, um, has achieved and what can be attributed to your inputs. Um, and so there are a lot of, um, of um, challenges in the area of collaboration, but it's, it's going to be essential because without it, again, no single institution. The other thing that's happening is, is, and is going to happen more is the role of the corporate sector. 30 or 40 years ago, you would have never found a foundation working with a for-profit company. It just was unheard of. Um, today, um, there is more and more a movement in that direction. Um, which I think, again, is, is, is going to be essential if the kind of change that we need in society um, without um, large corporations is going to be very difficult. Um, we're working on something in China um, through our Beijing office, and you know, there are not a lot of foundations investing in China. Um, and so if, if we're going to have partners in this, it's more likely going to be Coca-Cola or Motorola than it will be another foundation. And in fact, that's what we're finding in, in terms of this, this program. Um, the risk and challenge there, of course, is that corporations, of course, many of them, want to do uh, well uh, and do good in terms of social good. Um, but ultimately, they're concerned about brand. They're concerned about uh, return on equity. And an association with a foundation um, is a very alluring thing for a corporation because to be able to associate your brand with, a, with for example, the Rockefeller Foundation, which is a, a golden name in Asia uh, and in Latin America, particularly in China, where Rockefeller really, in fact, John D. Rockefeller's 
first grant was through the China Medical Board, but a long history and a very uh, esteemed and highly regarded name. So any corporation is going to want when given the opportunity to be associated in China with the Rockefeller Foundation, going to leap at that opportunity. Well, but what about what's in it for the Rockefeller Foundation? Because, because ultimately, there's got to be some good and some return um, and value added that isn't about uh, adding money to the corporation's bottom line. But, so I guess, in closing, I would say that um, I am very optimistic about philanthropy's potential for impact in this century. Um, but I do not think that philanthropy uh, will have the kind of impact it had in the 20th century, um, in, in this century, um, because I think that much of this century is going to be adjusting to a new reality and not about necessarily building huge institutions and building huge infrastructures, uh, but it's going to be much more about uh, how do we work in different ways to solve problems. And that may not be, you know, uh, again, I'm very optimistic. I'm simply saying it, it's got to be a different way. Um, it won't be the way of the past. And simply um, resting on one's laurels and saying, you know, well, look at our history. Uh, and therefore, um, we can expect the same from our future. Um, I don't think it's a reality. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, John. <clears throat> very, very stimulating and provocative. Glad you did. Um, we're open for questions. And uh, feel free, Darren is superb in terms of giving tape, so why don't you find out? Yes, Kristen. I'm really interested in this giving pledge that a lot of multi-billionaires have joined. Um, I think there are something like 69 of them, something like that. I mean, they're on 400. Um, and then there are many other billionaires who are pledging to give away unless they're in part, formally part of the pledge. Right? So it seems like we're, we're going to have this group of <coughs> individuals shuttling tens of billions of dollars into philanthropy in a fairly short time frame. And, I mean, it's still unclear you know, how quickly the lot, that'll actually be dispersed versus, you know, sitting there down or something like that. But I'm wondering, you know, if if you, you know, sort of the, the people who've been kind of well-established institutional philanthropies are thinking at all about how that might change the landscape, the timing of social change, the potential for, um, you know, great breakthroughs or for great mistakes um, or for, you know, frankly, you know, a lot of power being wielded by relatively unaccountable elite individuals, you know, and, and the, the potential for that to sort of set public agendas in a way that we used to do through, <laughs> or we think we do through democratic mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So just, that's a lot of big philosophical yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think um, the Giving Pledge is a brilliant idea. And I think um, it, 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 it was just brilliant. I mean, when you think about um, the idea of it, the structure of it, the um, creators of it. Um, it's a perfect storm for like success, right? I mean, everyone, even rich people like to be with other rich people. And, and they are competitive. And they're just like you and us, but they have billions of dollars. <laughs> and and, and when, one, when one hears that then and there is. So there's both the competition and then there's also the um, want to be associated with. And so people want to be associated with Bill and Melinda Gates and with Warren Buffett. Other rich people do. And Michael Bloomberg and David Rockefeller, Senior, etc. So I think the idea of like the way they created it and this behind the scenes, had these meetings and everything, it was just brilliant. And, and so I love the idea. I think your question about what this actually will amount to um, is is right. I mean, it is is the, the critical question, right? So so um, if it is um, a group of people who who unlike John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, for example, who who did not believe that just because they were rich that they had a preeminent knowledge of on every subject there is, uh, and therefore these people just need to be 
told what to do and because I got rich doing it in the for-profit sector, now I can, in the non-for-profit sector, do it too. I think that if they're not like that, um, I think that there is a huge opportunity. If they are like that, I think, as we've seen in some areas of, of the new philanthropy, I think there'll be some you know, pretty colossal failures in that. Um, for your question as to what it means specifically for Ford, for example, my, uh, the institution I uh, work for, um, I think the jury's out for us what it means because, in fact, we have not, um, uh, there's, there are not a lot of billionaires um, talking about social justice. And so we haven't um, seen a rush of, I mean, besides George Soros, of partners to say, um, we want to fund um, your um, litigation to ensure that um, people with AIDS have, have rights as people without AIDS. I mean, or um, the racial bias that's happening in, in, and is still embedded within certain structures of American society that Ford Foundation is well known for um, having, having um, thought. Um, we haven't seen a lot of, of new philanthropy rushing into those areas. Um, and so for us, the jury's out. I mean, our work, I think, is very clearly, squarely around um, a social justice lens. Uh, we are very concerned about uh, um, a, a growing inequality in our society and a diminished middle class and um, a diminished aspiration, particularly for uh, poor people. Um, and so for us, what, what we would hope out of this wonderful giving pledge is that there would be people who are signing those pledges who themselves or their heirs will be really interested in, in issues of social justice. Um, and we'll see. Um, but if, if, and that's not to say that if they're interested in museums and symphonies and giving to their universities, that that's not a good thing too. I'm simply answering your question. I, I for, for, Social Justice Foundation, like Ford or Soros, or you can count us all on one hand, unfortunately. Um, you know, the jury's out on whether this will benefit. Hi. I would think about your money, and I think about change. I think about the things you care about. And I was thinking about the extraordinary change in this country over the last 35 years, which some argue is simply the result of blind economic forces called globalization or whatever. Others, however, not just journalists, but others, had pretty well demonstrated that some very concerted thinking went into the destruction of an old social safety net order and the destruction of certain forms of political restraint on the exercise of massive power by capital. <clears throat> and that this was not a short-term victory. It was not something a program officer was going to say, hey, I took over the world in uh, 2012 uh, because of what I began. But you all don't think about this. And yet, why aren't you? You've watched an entire set of things happen because of the quite brilliant long-term thinking of folk who wanted to change the nature of this country. And they have succeeded in some very major ways by thinking very long-term, as opposed to thinking, I will solve the problem of hunger in five years, or I will do this. And in 35 years, they have, of course, undone the greatest middle class society the world ever created by deliberate policy changes, not by inadvertence. You all say you care about the kind of society they care to not have. Why aren't you about the business of building a 35-year objective? So that's a great um, observation and question, honey. And so one, I think what you're uh, challenging is first the notion that um, a single set of philanthropies can't have transformative change even today. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think you are right in that the investment by really two or three foundations in a set of ideas. A and set of, well, yes, right. The, the, the investment the, the, in, in those ideas which and all the people and all the, the, the evidence and research, well, 
and, and all the writing and all the, the, the information about um, that, uh, those ideas and an investment in, in that over a long period of time um, absolutely um, has contributed to, um, I think, a political context for 2012. Um, I think if there is a critique, and I have many, of modern philanthropy, um, first of all, um, many would say that um, going back to Rockefeller and Carnegie's early days, that that's exactly what happened in terms of modern progressive thought beginning in the 1930s. Um, and there were many who argued that um, but by the 1960s, and this was in part why all of the paranoia around the Rockefellers was so deep, was because they had so heavily invested in what we at RF called social innovation. And, and so all these ideas that people like uh, Roosevelt had, um, and look at who were on the boards of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation in those days, where they were all the people who had who were involved in the creation of the Great Society and all of these things that, um, so I think it's fair to say that on both sides of this political equation, um, progressive and conservative, there was um, a strategic investment over time both to create a middle class, a more inclusive society, um, and a set of progressive ideals about things like civil liberties and human rights and civil rights. Um, and, and that infrastructure was actually built primarily by three foundations. Um, and right, so a few years later, a group of conservative rich guys got together and said, you know, we see, we have a vision for a different world and we need to start investing through philanthropy in the ideas and in the institutions that will create that world and the political discourse because again, going back to the political engagement, you know, progressive foundation presidents were very engaged in straight up political activity well into 1969. And resulting in some pretty <coughs> positive progressive, if you were a progressive, uh, uh, policies and programs um, in places like North Carolina. Um, but today it's a different context. There in all respect. Just among us boys and girls. Please. You're telling me no foundation executive called up the most chatty president in American history, Bill Clinton, and didn't say, hey, 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 and hey, and they didn't have conversations about this country. I'm, I'm simply telling you that um, there is no way a, a foundation president did that with their lawyer sitting in the room or recorded it in any way. I, I mean, it doesn't, I'm not. I'm just simply saying the way the way out in the open, and the way in which normative policy and I mean normative practice pick up the phone, do you not even think about today? As you know, you are a foundation president. You don't pick up doing anything. You're going to call your lawyer, or your lawyer is going to say to you, "Be careful." And you know who wants to deal with that? Uh, Joe, give me one second to pursue a point that Karen was making. Uh, if if between you and Harding you can identify a small group of rich white folk in the 30s, 40s, 50s pushing society in one progressive direction, and then another small group pushing it into a more conservative direction. So now we're in 2012. Um, I just want you to take one more step, if you wouldn't mind. Do you see anything on the current horizon that suggests to you that there is formulating or coming together any comparable third group, a third era, that may bring us one way or another? I mean, I think it's much more difficult, in part because of what I said about influence. Uh, the, um, the set of conservative foundations were not concerned, uh, when, in putting together their ideas and their investments, were not concerned about did we include this Latino group over here? Did we include this women's group over here? Did we include the blacks from the... They, they had an agenda, and they... It is often for... Because uh, I think uh, there are many in, in modern 
with progressive philanthropy who um, are very concerned about inclusion, are very reluctant to assert without processes. Process. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. And, and I think that is very challenging when you're trying to wield influence. It's much easier to wield influence to have a kind of a command central and a point of view and to say, get in line. And if you don't get in line, get off the bus. Well, we, you know, we don't do that. We're, it's not inclusive. I don't know how to end it up. Well, Joe, Joe? Well, I, you know, I, I, think that, I think they're both right. right. I, think that, I think it's fair to say that the, that the establishment foundations have been much more conservative in trying to figure out how to counterattack. I mean, we know, we know that the, the conservatives really to attacking the model and using it basically against Ford and the other and the other liberal foundations. Bill Simon has written that. Everything we have done in, in the, the Owen Foundation where he was the chairman and everything else, he said, we copied from Mac Monday, essentially. So we know that. The question is the counterattack, how is that occurring? And there's a lot more on there's a lot more that's encouraging that has happened recently that I think is worth taking into account. Most of it has not been led by the, the traditional exactly. establishment foundations because of the fact, you ever talk to Rebecca Rymel, she says she, she just wanted to get rid of her lawyer because she kept telling her. Exactly. Finally, she ended up deciding, well, we're going to become a public charity, the only foundation that could do that, because she wanted to be free to do the kinds of things that she could do as a public charity that she can't do as a foundation. What's happening, really, and it's very interesting, and Mary Mountcastle sitting over here, really brought it to my attention, and that's, if you've ever read, there's a book called Blueprint, mm -hmm. uh, which, which documents what a group of wealthy donors and, and public charities and foundations in Colorado did, basically, to recapture the legislature. Uh, Paul, perfect, all perfectly legal uh, from, the, from the Republicans, took back both houses of the, of the legislature and captured, recaptured the governorship. And the point is, that there is, you, and I'm seeing this happening in a lot of places, including North Carolina, where Mary is basically spending a lot of time trying to orchestrate a similar effort, a cooperative venture on the left, or left of center, that brings together forces, both, both tax-benefited dollars and also non-tax-benefited dollars, and in, in, a, in an orchestrated campaign to do that kind of thing. It's happening all over the country. This is the counterattack, and it is, but, but it is, with the exception of a foundation like uh, Atlantic Philanthropies, which is not constrained because it's a Bermuda Foundation, and rather than an American Foundation, which put a lot of money into advocacy stuff in the last the go round, the, the big foundations have not been willing to get engaged directly in that. I understand it, but the fact is that, that, that there are things that big foundations can do if they're willing to be venturesome in order to participate in that effort. I think that if you, if you look, when you look at, the, at what has happened, you know, the, the, if think North Carolina is a paradigm example of this thing. We know that there was a, a huge, it was not just the, the, the conservative leaning foundation or public charities, but that they were pumping millions of dollars into the political races here in an organized fashion to take over the state legislature for the first time since Reconstruction. Both houses of the legislature were taken over by the well, it's time for us to counter to me and do the, and emulate the methods that they've used over the course of the last 20 years to do that. Do you remember our old associate Lisa Versace? Well, Mary, yeah. of those her activities well. And Lisa is the one who's leading the private money cooperative in this field. And of course, and among other things, the take back of the Raleigh School Board mm -hmm. was not done by indigenous monies. Mm -hmm. In the large part, it was outsiders and liberal money. Uh, coming in, I mean, local folks doing their work, but I mean, I mean, all of, uh, the point of this is, and what is that there is, there are cooperative folks out there who are not foundations, who think they might want to work as well as work with corporations, which have as a natural instinct a restraint on your drive toward any kind of social investment uh, kind of programs. But it's just alien to most of them. No, I think, I think you're, you're right. I think the, uh, I was simply making the case, the point, that, that influence is not going to be wielded by three or four 
large national, international foundations as it was 40 or 50 years ago. And the role that, yeah. that, that both the structures, systems, and laws, and practice have made it um, virtually impossible. So foundations today can participate, large national foundations can participate in these cooperatives. Again, this is when I said the co-creative process and you need to, you're gonna have to go in and just be at a table and be like everyone else and not be the chest thumping, we're here as Rockefeller and we're gonna lead you forward. Um, no, you're gonna sit and you're gonna listen and engage and collaborate and create something collectively and move forward collectively. Um, and that again is a different modality for a lot of these large institutions. Jenny? I was struck by your comment that philanthropy of the 20th century was building infrastructure and institutions which cost a lot of money. Absolutely. And if we're, if philanthropy is no longer doing that, my first thought is great. There's, there, it's tremendous windows for opportunity that cost a lot less. Right. Um, so I am, the, the instability of our society, the instability of our economic system, I think creates great opportunities for big ideas and vision. I think the, the nonprofit organizations through which foundations can invest and can have influence are much better prepared to take leadership. And particularly with funding on advocacy and training, I mean, I think it's, you know, foundations without their nonprofit partners are not as able to wield that sort of influence, but there's certainly ways to yield it, right. um, wield it um, with nonprofits as well, and in cooperation with other sectors, et cetera. So I, I think it's a cop out, frankly, to to say that we can't do it, or that we we had our day, or it's their day, or um, I mean, the power of that messy participation and inclusion ultimately is greater if we harness it. So I wasn't saying, uh, let me be clear, I wasn't, I, I, as I said, I am very optimistic. Um, and I'm simply saying, one, that we're not going to be about building big institutions on the hill and that that model we have to find alternatives to that model. And, and that has to happen. Um, um, because we, to think that what we're going to do is continue to build and build and build, when much of what we've already built is being challenged to be sustained, is not realistic. Um, secondly, um, I in no way am degrading um, participation and inclusion. I mean, that is, in fact, what that was at the heart of social justice. Um, I'm, what I'm saying is um, it is more challenging to harness from that influence and direction than it is in the example Hotting just gave, where it, it literally was the old model, where a group of white men are in a room and are pissed. And so there weren't others to partner with or to fund to actually get done what we wanted to get done. And you had to do it on your own. But now there are lots of partners. Again, many challenges. Have you tried getting the civil rights groups in a room and saying, okay, all of you, plus the women, get on the same page about what we want to do on fill in the blank. Good luck. I mean, it is, you know, I've done it. And it is not an easy task. It doesn't mean we don't, you know. Yeah, oh my God. Don't even talk about the environmentalists. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not easy. But it's essential. But, just hurt little monster, Newt Gingrich, proves something. If you keep butting their heads together in regular sessions, you can take flat earthers, you can take economic royalists, you can take religious fundamentalists, you can take all sorts of people and given a vision of control, you can make them work together. Because they were ludicrous in their disunity for so long because of their multiply competing agendas and their inability to even see the world through the same lens. We now think of them as this monolith, and we don't know how to do that. Give me a break. I mean, you just have to beat heads 
I mean, there has to be finally what they did, and they did it. They did it over and over in public. And we were being, you know, we were laughing at them. Look at those idiots. <laughs> As they put together something by Melvin, really major antithetical interest in one particular approach. So, uh, Darren's ego and uh, <laughs> logo combined to be Lego. <laughs> they've actually built their new environment. I was going to try to characterize the, um, and it sort of stems from something Joel was saying, I was thinking about it before he mentioned North Carolina work, the political influence, I would argue, and I'm curious what you think, has shifted to some extent to what you might call policy engagement. And so while uh, these pick up the phone and call the president without your lawyer in the room scenarios may not happen as much, or at least they may not happen and be recorded, as you're saying. You can go through the Rockefeller files, you know, can you go through the Gates files and see this noted? Probably not, though it may happen. Um, I think there are a lot of, my, my sense is that there are a lot of smaller and larger philanthropies that never even said the word policy, I'm going to say policy instead of political, that are now, and I think there's some in you know, North Carolina, that are really thinking seriously about policy engagement, not influence, and how can they collaborate to make a difference in the policy realm. And so that's good. I think that's really exciting. I think it's good news. I remember very vividly the pres former president of a large North Carolina foundation saying, I'm going to save on my voicemail. You may remember this, a message from the ethics, um, the North Carolina ethics office saying, yes, it's OK if you can engage with legislators because it took so long to actually get it in writing. So I right. think there's some right. positive offshoots of right. less direct political influence yielding more collaborative policy engagement. But I don't know if you, know, if you or others agree I with completely that. agree with that. Uh, I mean, that is really another, um, the way in which policy, again, today, um, because both there are more foundations um, I mean, this wonderful little, this is from you, Joe, from your, from your beta, but, but the number of foundations from 1930s to 2000, I mean, there are, there were, literally you could count them on two hands in the 1920s, and now there are over 33,000 grant-making foundations in America. Um, more. More like, more like 75. Really? They told me they took this from your book, Joel. Well, that was early edition. This was early edition. And they're grant making foundations? Yes. Oh, I'm going to correct my research. They may not necessarily be as bureaucratic as Ford. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Holly. Thank you. I can always tell. So let me, let me get back to your question, though. Seriously, I think there are, there are so many more foundations and so many more policy-focused organizations. And so the, when, when I talk about alternative arrangements and alternative, that's, what I'm, that's partly what I'm talking about. It's going to be through those mechanisms that, that policy actually and scale and issues like that actually get addressed and not necessarily frontally by a set of foundations setting an agenda. Um, and so the, 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 the challenge shifts to how do you harness all of that? How do, you, how do you get better collaboration? How do you frame an agenda um, for, uh, if, if you're working on, um, on an issue like LGBT issues, uh, on, a, on a ballot initiative in a state like North Carolina? How do you do it? Um, because you've got a lot of different interests and a lot of different people, all who are concerned about LGBT issues, but from a different perspective. You know? And how do you, how do you harness that? Can I just throw in one more factor? And you may want to ask uh, Rich Schnallbeck, who's sitting right here as well. Rich is a, a professor at law school who really specializes in the really in the in the detail and techniques of these issues relating to public and private action, political action, and those matters. He knows probably more about it than anybody. Well, certainly among the top few in the country who know it really in detail. Mm. The issue the issue is. What we've seen over the course of the last 10 years has been an increasing phenomenon whereby living donors of foundations basically uh, did not pay the heads of their foundations out of the tax benefit of dollars, mm -hmm. but, but after, ta after tax dollars. And the heads of the foundations were able to do all kinds of things, mm -hmm. and including lobbying, right. including engaging in politics, 
Uh, and we, we've seen that the IRS hasn't done anything about it. My sense is that it would be hard for them to do anything about it. But you've had parallel along the same track, this occurring with great, with great frequency. And there, you know, that's the Pete Peterson Foundation. Again, another example, billion dollar foundation engaged solely in the focus on the debt. Correct. Doing politics, doing lobbying, and everything else. So that's been happening at the same time. And in fact, it was that kind of thing that made the Colorado thing in part possible. We've got a foundation here in North Carolina uh, that uh, Barbara Goodman and Jim Goodman have. Barbara is the president. She doesn't get paid by the foundation. She's lobbying all the time for affordable housing, social center for justice, and things like that. So there are a lot of ways in which people who run foundations can do things other than through the foundation straightjacket. That's why P.R. Midyard yep. set up the Midyard Network. Exactly. Because he wanted not to be constrained by it. You were there when we walk up and down the hip street at the halls of Congress lobbying on urban investment on behalf of a pseudo right. thing called Living City. Right. An and alternative. We took off our president of right. various foundations right. and put on our member of Living City right. hat and walked around cars and said, right. you know, we were representing Living Cities and we were lobbying mm -hmm. for political action. Mm -hmm. And they were the major corporation, well, but not the word, I mean, not few, but I mean, major foundations doing this behind that facade. And believe me, our friends would have come and got us if we weren't, if we weren't, uh, if we weren't legally entitled. Richard, did you want to say anything about uh, Well, I wasn't sure what the narrow question was, but you were just about to pose it. Well, the thing. narrow question really is, what are the limits with respect to what the, the uh, actors like this can do with, with, with like the Colorado situation, or the kinds of things that I described with, with, with the living donors engaging in politics, uh, in, co in, co in collaboration, basically, with their foundations. Well, Joel, you're a lawyer, uh, I know, and um, you know that lawyers are a cautious <laughs> bunch. And so it's certainly true that uh, if you're a foundation president and you ask your lawyer what you can do, he'll tell you something like, well, you know, you can testify if you get invited and we can probably, you know, get the Council on Foundations to arrange an invitation. So you can do that. You can fund a think tank that's producing research papers and those, those are not without influence. The Cato and Heritage are a big part of, uh, of what Cotting was talking about. So even within the straitjacket, there's a fair amount that's possible, but you're talking about things that are really kind of outside the straitjacket altogether. And those are, those are certainly possible. Some, some issues about uh, gift taxes. Uh, you need a charitable deduction even from the gift tax. Uh, but the IRS, is, the IRS is, has been very lax about uh, uh, enforcement on that uh, for a while. But you worry, you know, that if, if it does seem as though making a gift of, of five million might create uh, Two and a half million of gift tax liability somewhere down the road. There, there, there is reason to be cautious, even if the IRS isn't uh, actively enforcing it. So, uh, again, I, I guess I don't know what to say exactly, except just that there are reasons for caution. But um, you'll always get the most cautious advice from your lawyers, and so you, you know. So what do we ask? Ask, <laughs> ask all of the non-lawyers around <laughs> what uh, what, uh, what you'd like to do, and I, I, I there. I'd like to see a few more uh, test cases. Uh, right. I'd, like, I'd like to see somebody create some foundations and, and uh, have them push the edges uh, and, and see if the IRS bites at it. And then if they do, uh, you, you can get declaratory judgments through the tax court uh, pretty quickly and easily. Uh, I think somebody ought to orchestrate some of those. Well, it would be interesting, again, going back to the earlier question about the, the, the pledge, the giving pledge. I mean, how are those donors really likely to be engaged and want to really push the envelope um, to a lot, to do this kind of work. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I, and I, you know, it would be a mistake to assume that they're all of like mind. I mean, that's a part of. Um, I mean, and and then you talked about knocking heads, but you know, uh, that that sort of assumes that there is some orchestrator in chief who who has the moral authority to uh, to do that and to prescribe a vision that uh, that, that people ought to be willing to have their heads knocked about, and I, I'm not sure. There, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, variety out there in, in the political viewpoints. And I, I guess my own sense of, of, of this um, kind of right-wing takeover 
doesn't have as big a role in it for the foundations as you seem to suggest. But I, I know you're, you're kind of more politically savvy and plugged in than I am, so I'm not ready to say you're wrong. It's just, uh, there's a lot going on out there, and a lot of it's way beyond the control of any foundation or group of foundations. You thought I was saying that. Right. Yeah. I said okay. long-term thinking on the right by people who wish to undo the circumstance in which yeah. the country found it. Okay, I thought there was an implication that well, we're working through that. They certainly were. I mean, yeah. already. I mean, we discussed at least one of the major ones who were working quite consciously. Poland, yeah. Toward Conrad. Yeah, I mean, but, but you know, there's not a lot of money there. I mean, Olin, MacArthur, uh, well, Heritage, Cato, they're. Together. Yeah. So, but it, the, the other, I think the other reality, though, is that it. It really isn't as much about the money. I mean, I think that that was the other lesson, is that it wasn't that hundreds of millions were actually needed to affect an agenda. But I think you're right, the, the variation of the kinds of organizations that are going to have to be involved going forward, it looks very different. Let me, let me uh, cut in, because uh, I want to open up a little bit. Fiona, you had a question. Well, yeah. Uh, Shelley, you had a question, I think. Um, I guess and Tim, I think. One, two, three. My question is maybe more of a comment, but if, if the system of influence has become disaggregated, then is an inclusive process an advantage? I don't know if, see, all of this right wing takeover of the judgment, I completely agree with what Hadi is saying, and I'd love to see the progressive foundations in North Carolina team up and do the policy engagement that you're talking about. On the other hand, you know, you can't, a lot of it happened during the period when you could have your essay published in the New York Times, and that would be incredibly influential, and I think we're seeing, and you know, Occupy Wall Street is a good example of this, there's this thing that sort of happens, and it spreads and no one controls it, and it can be very powerful, and if you build, and building that over time requires inclusion, because otherwise people walk away from it, and, and it, some, some body <coughs> trying to control it, kills it. And so if you have an inclusive process, and you build that, and you, as, as Ford and others have done over time, isn't maybe now the time to, to really uh, make sure the network links are strong and feed them and you know really move it out. It's a, we have a completely different communications and this is another comment I was going to make. You know, the two infrastructures that we have that need to be dismantled and rebuilt, one of them is, in my mind, communication. And, and I know that you know that from the work that Ford is doing on communications policy, but I mean, we are going to have a complete overhaul of the radio the broadcast system that we know that on which public television and public broadcasting on radio is built, that's going to be completely different. And I don't know how long it'll take, but if we're going to have something different, and now is really the time for that. And so it relates back to that the world's going to look different, but it's not all a bad thing for people who don't like to butt heads and, and all things like that. I mean, the only, the only observation I would make is I agree. So I said, I talked about the sort of distributed network, but if you really study the literature on network theory, you've got to have nodes, and you've got to have, you, you've got to have places where there is an aggregation, and, and it can't just be completely, and those nodes have to aggregate up to, I mean, what, is, what, what comes out of those nodes has to be about an agenda, and it and it has to go somewhere, um, and somebody has to you know coordinate and organize and support. And to me, that's the question, and that's the challenge. It can be done, and we've seen it done. I mean, it's not as if this can't be done. We've seen lots of of uh, of times. I mean, where these these networks have actually added up to to real important social change. Um, I'm, I'm simply saying we're going to have to rely on that more in the future rather than less. My question is, is somewhat similar to Fiona's in that in looking at the media landscape, and I know that's your, your, your special area of focus at the Ford Foundation is, is media and culture. And, and uh, when you're talking about influence and the impact foundations can have and how much influence they can wield, how has the history over the last 30 years of foundation development and influence and impact um, how does that overlay with the change in the media landscape, and where is it going? Well, I think it is. It, it has. Um, I think it has mirrored it. I mean, I think when there was a concentrated media um, and a, a concentrated set of 
institutions in society that wielded a disproportionate power. Um, you know, foundations were a set of foundations, national, international foundations, were very uh, uh, powerful institutions, uh, publicly powerful and recognized. Um, and I think as things have, as, as influence and media um, have become more disseminated and distributed, um, it is harder to harness that um, and control it to, um, and to influence it. Uh, that's not to say that many would argue that today we, we have, again, a situation with a few people uh, with a, a disproportionate share of power. Um, but certainly the way in which um, influence and power in society was organized and philanthropy being a key player in that system, that's changed. And, it, and just as it has in me, I mean, the influence of, of CBS, I mean, CBS, you used to say CBS in America, and Bill Paley, and people would be, I mean, who even knows who the head of CBS is today? I mean, no, I mean, who, who, do you, do you <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, I mean, who, I mean, there was a day when, when you would say that, and people knew exactly who was, who Bill Paley was, and what CBS was because it wielded so much power in our society. Yeah, I say liberals talking to each other always ignore the reality which is countervailing, which is that there are major media figures mm. who influence society mm. and who control much of yes. the You can talk about your friend Rupert Murdoch. The ones we used to know. But you know what i got to say, Australia, he has an idea. <laughs> Or Bill O'Reilly for you. Yeah, for, you yeah, exactly, your dear friend Hottie. Uh, <laughs> do we have a, do we have a sec? Tim? Okay. Um, sorry. Well, just, okay, huge, you know, huge fan of board, have benefited enormously um, over the years. The um, one, it's really expensive to defend institutions and it's really easy to blow them up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, Suffer. you know, we're going through that phase right now and we'll see what comes out the other side. And I think the sort of watch this space fight is going to be a really interesting one around healthcare reform, which is the most, from what I can tell, the most recent interesting big new institution um, that that has been created out of this out of this government and this economy, and I think it's going to be a fascinating summer um, with Supreme mm -hmm. Court ruling, and then to watch how the different parties deal with however that ruling comes out. And I'm just curious: is this sort of, you know, what's the what are some of the big foundation heads doing in this regard, and getting ready for that uh, for what's going to happen next summer? Well, I think the. It, it's hard to uh, talk about, you know, getting ready for next summer. I mean, I think um, we recognize, again, a long-term um, um, engagement in policy is essential, right? And um, any battle at any given time or any challenge um, is, is what happens in that moment. Uh, but I don't think that, um, you know, foundations are going to be seeking to um, to engage in, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Supreme Court's going to decide. I mean, just as the Supreme Court decided in Brown or decided in Bakke or decide, I mean, they're going to decide a major public policy and there will be implications. Obviously, um, many of, of, of our grantees who are concerned about equity and fairness and justice um, are deeply engaged in the policy around it, the research around it, the litigation around it, um, and we're supporting them. Um, with the point of view that we uh, believe that um, it is a good thing in a society when there is universal coverage and, and that all Americans can participate in the benefits of, of our prosperous nation. Um, and so we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, it's, we, foundation heads aren't sitting around a table and saying, okay, you know, let's decide what we're going to do about the outcome of the health care I mean, uh, law. I mean, that, that specific piece of legislation, there, that specific there, outcome of the yeah. case. Well, the reason I ask is that because no matter which way it goes, it's going to be a huge political football mm -hmm. then for the presidential election. Mm -hmm. And so I just 
wondering is there, are people thinking about how are we going to, you know, if, if it passes, Obama's going to come under, you know, extreme attack, and if it fails, then he'll use that um, to sort of do an you know, another version of Occupy Wall Street, and when people really realize the benefits that they've lost under that. So I'm just sort of curious. It, your answer is good. Right, yeah, um, but I so think, I mean, uh, just, just to be clear, I mean, on, our issue is not um, influencing elections. Our influence, our issue is ensuring that every American votes and that there are as few barriers to that as possible. And that um, the process works better when that happens. And so our focus uh, won't be on any specific piece of legislation, or that's not what we're about. But I do think that um, if every American is engaged uh, in the process, there will be better outcomes for our democracy. And that's sort of our issue. That's the way we're focused on these issues. It's not sitting around a table and saying, okay, healthcare this, check. Reauthorization of the Secondary Education Act, check. It's just not, it's just not the way we, we, we operate. Darren, does that imply that Ford will be, over time, shifting its focus in any way toward greater attention to social justice than before, less attention to something else? Um, can we expect over the next five years uh, sort of a different focus or a slight shift in focus? Um, where do you see that happening, if at all? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Luis Ubinas, our president, um, has a very, I think, clear vision about social justice and about uh, the foundation being engaged um, in um, the kind of fundamental issues of the day around social justice. The, the core one of voting and and political engagement um, is critical. Um, so our work in uh, civil rights um, is absolutely being beefed up, um, most certainly. Um, I think our, our work in, um, in education uh, and in media, uh, two other areas where there's a great interest in um, social justice content, more of it in media, and more focus of it uh, in journalism. Um, and our work in, in poverty and assets. Um, a real clear concern about what's happening to low income and the middle class in this country. And so if there is, if there, there will be less field building. I mean, Ford Foundation was a field building foundation and that was what we were for most of our modern history. Uh, we're not going to be building fields um, um, as a priority. It's going to be much more about engagement um, with fields that are already built to harness and, and help them um, achieve goals, uh, social justice goals. Let's do one more question if we've got uh, one more person willing to ask. Um, great, I uh, see a little flutter there. Um, you mentioned that you have uh, led uh, two uh, quite um, pressing foundations here in the United States. Looking at your position, at those foundations, what would you say that is your personal seal regarding to those two foundations? Is there something that you can identify and say, looking as a leader, looking as a manager who is leading those two foundations, what is your personal seal? My personal <coughs> seal. I'm not sure I got the word. Seal. Personal seal, which means that your unique contribution. Your stamp. Oh, my own little stamp. Oh, gosh. Oh, you're so nice to ask that question because, um, um, I, you know, history is going to be made. No, it really isn't. Because um, I, I have, I, have, I believe that um, my role at both the institutions has been to hopefully support um, the president um, and achieving uh, the success of um, his or her administration, um, and so. I don't um, profess to have um, uh, any personal uh, seal um, at either institution. Um, I, I hope that um, I'm judged to have uh, been a very good lieutenant at both institutions. Um, but I think the agenda at both of the institutions that I've been with um, has been very much set. And a big part of my job is to make sure that it gets executed. 
It's not to say that I don't have a point of view, which uh, is often infused um, and, and heard, um, and, and advice that gets taken. Um, but, you know, my role at both places is sort of, sort of be behind the curtain and make sure everything is running well and, um, and hope that good outcomes happen. The Wizard of Oz. Thank you, Joel. You brought me right back to the title. <laughs> Mr. Bland, he has never been. And whatever he's saying now is a nonsense. I mean, he always <laughs> said quite a bit. <laughs> well, on behalf of the group here, um, I want to take uh, the opportunity to say thank you, Dan. is alive and well, and we will continue to be here. Uh, we will adjourn for this semester and return in January, and uh, the agendas and the people have already been secured, um, and you will learn of them in 